Good evening. I'd like to call to order County Council's meeting for February 3rd, 2021. Please rise and we'll pledge allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, um, I wanted to make one brief announcement. We did have a, uh, an executive session uh, just prior to this uh, meeting where we talked about uh, litigation and also um, uh, uh, personnel uh, labor issue. Um, and Mr. Uh, Mr. Martin gets upset with me if I don't say that at the beginning of the meeting. So there, I've done it. Um, we have, uh, we accept public comment at the beginning and the end of every meeting uh, of, of our Wednesday meetings. Comments at the beginning of the meeting are to be reserved for things that are on tonight's agenda. And then comments at the end can be about anything else uh, that one wishes to raise. Comments can be telephoned in to 610-891-4931 and we will transcribe them and read them into the record or you can send them by email to public comment at co.delaware.pa.us. Please include your name and address and we will, uh, we will read them into the record. And so I will look to uh, Mr. Lichtenstein, I guess, to I think has access to any emails that may have come in or any other public comments that may have come in for things on the agenda. Mr. Lichtenstein. Yeah, I, I have a, sorry, go ahead. Before John jumps in, I have one in front of me. This is relating to item number five, COVID vaccination update. And it while it addresses the personal situation of an individual, and I won't provide, I will not provide her name and address, the inquiry is broad enough that I'll state it and suggest that um, the, the uh, folks who are providing the COVID vaccination update could respond to this perhaps during their presentation. My husband and I fall into the 1A, 1A phase category specified by the CDC to be vaccinated. I've also registered both my husband and I on the necessary Chester County, Delaware County websites. Recently, I received an email that didn't provide much information but did include we would be receiving a link with further instructions. It also noted a facility location in Yaden that was doing the administrating. As you can see, I live in media and Yaden would be a difficult distance. Is there anything else we need to know to do to get the vaccine? Or is there any other place I can be steered to expedite how and when we get the vaccine? I am trying to advocate and be proactive in getting vaccinated please help me understand or provide any additional information that would help my husband and I get vaccinated. Um, I know that Mr. Lichtenstein has some comments. John, to the extent they are related specifically to item number 17, the resolution on residency, we, I, I presume, can incorporate them as part of the hearing portion of number seven. But if there are other agenda items other than number seven, this would be the time to share them. Okay, I will save the ones. There are a number on the residency. Um, I will read the ones on vaccination. I don't, there are also a number on opening schools. Would you consider those to be related to number six or, or sorry, related to the number five, the COVID vaccination update, or if they should wait for the end of the meeting? I think they should wait till the end of the meeting. Okay. Um, we have a comment from Joan Mitchell, 436 Spring, Springfield Ave in Folsom. The current directives put out lead to dead ends at this time, may need updating or looking into. Recommending a county health department staffer test out the directives to see the obstacles encountered in getting appointment. Surveys with no appointment, phone numbers with no answer, no callbacks when messages left. All referred vaccine sites have no available appointments or page not found when link is accessed. Trying to get appointment for elderly paralyzed mother with diabetes who I take care of. Need effective resource information, been trying since January 22nd. Thank you for your time and attention to this matter. The next is from Peggy Brandon Wilson, 824 Drexel Avenue, Drexel Hill. The president announced that the vaccines are going to be shipped directly to pharmacies beginning next week. How will that impact distribution in Delco? I am signed up through Chester County. I know some people have been able to schedule directly with the provider, but that seems to depend on luck or who you know. 
I understand there's a supply shortage, shortage, but could you please clarify what is the most reliable way a person in category A1 can get the vaccine? And that's it for ones commenting on the agenda, other, other than the ones where the, the ones that'll be read as part of the public hearing portion for the proposed ordinance. All right, thank you, Mr. Lichtenstein. Um, you know, I think uh, council might have comments on those comments, but I think maybe it's best to be, we'll cover that in uh, agenda item number five um, with Ms. Halt and, Ms. and Dr. O'Mahony can, uh, can speak to some of those issues. Unless other council cares to speak in, speak now. All right, I will turn to Dr. Taylor then for the reading of the motions. Uh, agenda item number four is a motion for approval of minutes of the regular meeting of January 20th, 2021. Second. Any questions or comments from council on the minutes? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? I have it. Agenda item number five is a COVID and vaccination update. Good evening, council. Good evening. Um, so I wanna begin, I'll address the questions that were in um, the public comment first. So just for clarification, if you receive an email um, and you are receiving a link, that is your time to register for the vaccine you're, and you can select your appointment. We only have two vaccination sites that are currently run by the county and they are in Yaden and Aston. Um, unfortunately, if you miss that link is only um, active for a week. And so if, you know, we really encourage you to um, utilize those sites um, and that's the only two sites that we have available run by the county at this time um, until more vaccine becomes available. In regards to, um, we know that there is a huge vac vaccine shortage and, I, and we keep saying it, I know it's frustrating. Um, there, there are some vaccine providers, but um, right now uh, I know that Crozier is scheduling into July and Mainline Health is scheduling into May. Um, so the other providers that may be available are um, available on the Pennsylvania Department of Health's website and we will have a link for that on the Delaware County webpage as well. Um, with, we also have information there with the um, vaccine providers as we know it listed. Um, it, we do know that it's very, very difficult to get a vaccine. 40% of Delaware County's population falls into 1A. And so that means that um, to over 260,000 people are in 1A and our allocation of vaccine is very, very limited. And I'll talk a little bit about that when I um, do the report. I think, did I cover every, the questions I hopefully covered accurately. Um, so let me begin today saying that, as I said, vaccine still remains limited. And we are hopeful that the supply chain from the federal level will open up soon. Um, we still ask everyone's patience as we work to process the thousands of pre-registration forms. Right now, we're at 21,000 people have pre-registered. We know many of you have been waiting several weeks for appointments, and we are doing our best to accommodate with the limited um, supply of vaccine. As a reminder, Delaware County opened our COVID-19 call center on Monday, January 25th to answer COVID-19 related questions from individuals, organizations, and businesses. The COVID-19 call center will be open Monday through Friday between the hours of 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. In addition to responding to phone calls, the center will also respond to emailed inquiries. The phone number for the call center is 484-276-2100. Again, that's 484-276-2100. We do know that the call center has been overwhelmed with calls um, when we initially opened and we are addressing that by hiring additional staff and utilizing um, other call center resources. If you'd like to email us, it's covid19resources 
at co.delaware.pa.us. Again, that's COVID-19 resources at co.delaware.pa.us. Both of this, um, the phone number and email is also listed on the county's uh, webpage. While the call center staff will attempt to answer all COVID-19 related questions, the immediate mission will be to address questions related to the county's updated COVID-19 vaccination plans and to provide assistance to individuals interested in receiving a vaccination or looking for a COVID test. The call center staff will focus will be on working with the residents to determine their vaccination phase, assisting phase one at residents who have been unable to complete the phase one vaccine interest survey on the, the website, using online registration, helping residents locate um, convenient COVID-19 testing sites if available, and answering general questions about COVID-19 testing and vaccinations. General questions about COVID-19, quarantine, guidelines, masks, restaurants, seating capacity, and other questions about COVID should be still directed to the Chester County Health Department at 610-344-6225. And again, that's Monday through Friday, 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. The current data for the county is as follows. Um, as of today, Delaware County, through all vaccine providers in the county, have administered 21, 20, 7,937 partial doses of vaccine and 7,538 full doses of vaccine, second dose completed. Pennsylvania has 634,458 people um, partially receiving um, vaccine doses and 216,361 receiving completed doses. Important to note that these numbers reflect where individuals live and not necessarily where they got the vaccine. Um, most, and regarding our COVID positivity rate, most recent seven day percent positivity is 8.81%, showing a downward trend from four weeks ago, which was at 11.47%. Our most recent seven day incidence rate of 204.85 per 100,000 residents is also showing a downward trend from 271.55 um, from four weeks ago. Both of these are encouraging and our, we look at them as our hopeful point as we battle together for um, in the COVID response. Our vaccination plan is that Delaware County continues to implement its vaccination plan with the newest site of the Delaware County Wellness Center in Yaden, which opened last week. The city of Chester site, we plan to have an op operational by mid-February, as well as um, another location in Springfield later in February, depending on vaccine availability. The county does have a mass vaccination planning underway, which includes several locations across the county. The county is waiting for vaccine to become readily available to open these locations, which we hope would be in early spring. As a reminder, other vaccine provider locations are available on the Pennsylvania Department of Health vaccine website. Again, that link is on our Delaware County um, website. The county continues to plan for special needs individuals and those who are homebound. Planning continues with our human services department and other county organizations on the best method of reaching all county residents. And again, once vaccine supply opens up. And at this point, I would like to introduce Dr. Lisa o. Mahini, who is gonna update everyone on um, some important information about COVID vaccination. Uh, good evening, everyone. I just wanted to share our experience related to frequently asked questions um, that we have encountered at the vaccine sites in Aston and Yaden, and also um, at the Delaware County COVID-19 call center. Um, many questions surround the eligibility for phase 1A, and we are helping review with our uh, residents, the CDC and Pennsylvania Department of Health guidelines to help callers understand whether or not they have underlying medical conditions. And this, this is difficult because some of it becomes gray zone and we really um, wanna help people navigate um, the phase 1A as it's, as it's outlined. Uh, as, as Rosemary, alluded, it really is so inclusive and um, has really uh, extended the, the number of people who are eligible. 
there, there really are very rare instances where we're telling people they're not eligible, but um, this at, at least is, is helping endorse their questions and concerns. And we are trying to get them on, on lists quickly to get, um, to get immunized. Another question that comes up is, um, do I still need the vaccine if I've been infected with the virus? And our answer is to explain that we don't know how long natural immunity from infection lasts. If you've had COVID-19 infection within the last 90 days, uh, you do not need to receive the vaccine at this time. It's uncommon for people to get COVID within this time frame, but after 90 days, the vaccine is recommended. People also ask, can I get the vaccine if I've been recently vaccinated with another uh, vaccine? And the recommendation, uh, CDC and, and other uh, agencies, is that a 14-day window of time on either side of the COVID-19 vaccine is recommended. So if people have had a very recent flu vaccine or pneumococcal vaccine, we really have to turn them away if they haven't um, waited the 14 days. Um, something that comes up quite a bit is the concern if um, the individual has been under treatment or has an underlying condition that affects the immune system. And uh, essentially, there are no known medications that interact with the vaccine. Um, a weakened immune system may affect a robust antibody response. So there may be a limited antibody response to the vaccine, but the vaccine is still recommended nonetheless. And then finally, if people are pregnant, they're questioning whether or not uh, they're candidates for the vaccine. And certainly pregnancy is a risk factor for complications with COVID-19. We generally recommend discussing the vaccine with their personal physician or OBGYN, but um, at the end of the day, uh, COVID uh, vaccine is recommended. Um, we are reminding individuals to not come to the vaccine site if they're not feeling well. We are modeling best practices at our sites uh, with social distancing, hand sanitizers and disinfectants. Um, and I have to say, if you've not been to the vaccine sites, it's really a sight to behold. Um, we get so many compliments and so much nice feedback about how well run um, the system is. People are not waiting long. Uh, times and um, it truly is a very professional and dedicated team out there, largely uh, volunteers. So it's it's um, it's a very positive place to be. Thank you. Um, I, I I had a question, or maybe just clarification. I think I know the answer to it, but I, I want to make sure. So <laughs> many of the emails and telephone calls that I've received seem to be under the um, misconception that the county is somehow in charge of the vaccination of all of the citizens of Delaware County. Um, as I understand it, it's sort of this constellation of folks who are administering vaccines. It may be, in some instances, it may be a health system, a, 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 um, a, a hospital. In other instances, pharmacies are doing it. In some instances, perhaps the county is doing it. And at least in uh, some settings, I think it's pharmacies that are going out to um, nursing homes, for instance, to administer. Uh, it, have I got that right? There, there is no sort of person or entity in charge of this short of, I guess, the Pennsylvania Department of Health in some aspects and the CDC in other respects. Is that, have I got it right? That's, that's correct. Um, Delaware County is one of the many vaccine providers in the county. We don't distribute the vaccine to those providers. That is the distribution is between the Pennsylvania Department of Health and um, the CDC. So we um, are coordinating with our um, healthcare partners in the um, county that are providing the vaccine and we're supporting them to the best of our ability, but we're not providing them the vaccine, nor do we have the ability to request more vaccine for any provider, even ourselves. All right, so we, we sort of, we make a request of the state every week. We'd say, you know, geez, we, we could administer 4,000 doses this week if you would give it to us. And we ask them for 4,000 doses or whatever the number is. And they come back and they say, you get X, you get 1,000 or you get 2,000. 
Um, and I presume other providers are doing that same thing. They're requesting whatever they think they could administer. And, and then it kind of goes into a bit of a black box and the state, depending on how much vaccine they have, presumably, then doles it out. And that's the case throughout all of Pennsylvania? That's correct. Yes. Okay. And we sometimes do not, I did not know how much vaccine we were getting until it actually was delivered this morning. Which that's was with the exception of Philadelphia, right? Is Philadelphia it acts separately? They, they get their supplies outside of the state? Philadelphia is, um, gets their supplies directly from the CDC. So they get a direct federal allocation versus all the other counties in Pennsylvania that have to go through the Pennsylvania Department of Health. And Brian, I'm not sure if you were done, but just to dovetail on one of the things you said there, um, is it not, so I think there's this sort of, you know, uh, general view that Delaware County is, is not getting vaccinated um, at the same rate as, as other counties. Uh, and perhaps they sort of look at, you know, purely the, the county administered vaccinations as opposed to the other vaccinations that occur through these other independent providers. Um, last I had seen, you know, Delco is the, well, I know this, this doesn't change, but Delaware County is the fifth largest county population wise in the state. And last I'd seen, we were either fourth or fifth in terms of the total number of our residents that had gotten vaccinated. So we were effectively sort of in line with um, our population. Is that still the case? Yes, that's correct. And so as I noted in the beginning, um, while it may look like some counties are receiving more vaccines, um, they, that is because um, primarily through their health systems. And so for example, Mainline Health is receiving vaccine for um, at the one Montgomery County location, but they're located in Delaware County and Chester County. So it may look like Montgomery County is getting more vaccine because Mainline Health is receiving it, but it's, um, it's really you know, a disjointed system but the actual number of people being vaccinated in Delaware County is comparable to our suburban counterparts throughout the state. Oh, that, so that's helpful. Can I follow up on that real quickly? So if Mainline Health gets a, gets a thousand doses of vaccine, it's gonna show as having been received in Montgomery County because that's their headquarter, even if they ship 500 of those vaccines to one of their hospitals or their, their settings in Delaware County. That's correct. Okay. So that's why the, if you look on, a lot of people were talking about how Lehigh Valley got so many vaccines, but really it, the Lehigh Valley health system services four counties. And so, you know, it, it came to that county, but it looked like disproportionately higher than other surrounding counties. But when you look at the vaccination rates for the surrounding counties, it, it's about even. All right. Well, I will say uh, publicly that one of the roles that I think council has in this regard is to jump up and down and ask for more vaccine. And I can tell you that we are jumping up and down and asking for more vaccine. I was in contact with the governor's office today with uh, Senator Kane, Senator Carney, Senator Williams, Rep. Kruger. Um, all of us are doing our darndest to get as much vaccine as we can in Delaware County. Uh, and uh, I, I trust other counties are doing the same thing. But we are we are doing what we can and um, we will continue to do that. So it's not for lack of trying. Uh, if somebody has a constructive suggestion as to how we might be able to get more vaccine, I am all ears and happy to, happy to uh, take some, uh, sit, take constructive criticism if there's something that we could be doing better. Uh, on the heels of that, uh, the, oh, go ahead. Can I ask a question? I, sure. I, I, what, you mentioned that there were 21,000 pre-registered in 1A. What is the basis by which you determine who receives the email inviting them to schedule an appointment? So if they were in the original group of 1A, so we're still trying to vaccinate unaffiliated healthcare workers and healthcare workers so that they were already at the top of the list. So we're still trying to get through that list. And then we're going by date. So the date that they had registered. And if they qualify for 1A, that's how we're doing it. But just remember, I got a thousand doses of vaccine for a week. So it's slow. Um, we're hoping that it'll pick up soon, but it's, it's a slow process. And I know people are frustrated. Um, I just want to dovetail that, that comment about being frustrated and Brian's comment about, about how much we are trying. Um, the level of frustration 
right now in our county and in our nation is pretty high because there is not enough vaccine and everyone wants it yesterday. Totally understand about, stand it. Take the amount of frustration that you are feeling and multiply it for us who are trying to get it for you. But I want to assure you, I just want everyone listening to this to, to know that this county and the people that are working in this county are, are going to the ends of the earth and beyond to get set up so that when this vaccine is available, it's going to flow seamlessly. There are literally over a thousand volunteers that have stepped forward, gotten trained, and are ready to administer this vac vaccine. And the people that have, have put this plan together, um, people on this screen and, and dozens more who are working all week, every day, all day, trying to get, putting together this scheme that we can get this vac vaccine out. Imagine how frustrated we are that we put all this work in and there's no vaccine. So please be patient and know that everything is being done that could possibly be done. And as this vaccine supply ramps up, it will start to flow because we are ready. I thank, and I thank you, um, Councilwoman Schaefer. I do want to actually also add in, um, and this has been a commonly asked question this week, um, because of the, um, the vaccine issue in Philadelphia, where they had shut down their large scale mass vaccination site, we've been getting um, several requests about um, second doses. Um, and if you can get them in Delaware County, Unfortunately, the Pennsylvania Department of Health has directed that um, where you get your first vaccine is where you have to get your second vaccine. And there's several reasons for that. One of which is there's two current vaccines. It's either Pfizer or Moderna, and you can't interchange those. So if you got a vaccine with Moderna, you have to get the second dose with Moderna. So that's causing a lot of confusion. So what we want people to you know, keep in mind is if you go on vacation and you went to Florida and you got vaccinated in Florida and you come back up here, we may not be able to give you your second dose. And um, you know, we're gonna try to accommodate those as we can, but we're still trying to get through um, many of our own first doses. And so we're encouraging people to really keep that in mind that where you get your first dose is where you have to get the second. And I hope I got all the other questions. I appreciate, uh, appreciate the update. Anything further from council? All right, well, thank you both. And we will uh, uh, do this two weeks from now. And obviously we're, we're continuing to provide updates through our uh, public relations department and we'll continue to do so. Dr. Taylor. Thank you. Agenda item number six, motion for approval, second reading and consideration of adoption of ordinance 2021-1, amending section 6-20G of the administrative code regarding residency of county employees. Second. We have a motion and a second. I think uh, as is custom, we will have um, Mr. Martin read the title of the ordinance and provide a brief summary. And then I think it would be appropriate for us to listen to public comments that might um, be, uh, have been submitted with regard to this. So Mr. Martin. Yes, yes Mr. Chair, um, ordinance number 2021-1, an ordinance of the County of Delaware, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, amending section 6-20G per in one of the administrative code regarding residency of the county employees. Uh, in summary, the county code currently provides the county employees are to be residents of the county and that in certain circumstance, this requirement has impacted the county's ability to attract uh, sufficient qualified employees and that a more flexible application of this section uh, would improve the quality of the personnel employed by the county. So this ordinance would amend uh, the section in the following respects. Uh, it would provide that notwithstanding the existing provision that individuals who at the time of hire are not residents of the county uh, will be eligible to be hired uh, if they intend to establish their residency in the county within three months of their start date. 
uh, and that the executive director, based on the recommendation of the director of personnel, may grant extensions to such three month period as required to maintain a qualified workforce or where good faith effort by the employee is demonstrated to establish residency. And, that, and such a three month extension uh, may uh, be extended further, not to exceed an aggregate of 12 months, except that with the approval of council, that total extension period could reach an aggregate of 24 months. That is the provision as it relates to individual employees. A, another aspect of this ordinance would allow for council to exempt certain categories or classifications of personnel from this provision uh, with a finding that the exemption is necessary to allow the county to hire a sufficient number of qualified employees. But such exemption will expire within 24 months unless it is extended further by council. Um, the amendment, uh, or excuse me, the ordinance provides in further that any existing county employees uh, who are not in fact in compliance currently with this section may establish their residency within three months of enactment and that the same extension provision previously referenced would apply to such um, employees. Uh, the the uh, ordinance further clarifies that this ordinance will not be applicable to county employees who are hired under the civil service system they will continue to be uh, governed by existing state regulations. And if approved, this ordinance would take effect on the 10th day after its adoption. So that is the ordinance in summary, uh, as required by our procedure, there is to be a hearing now on this ordinance and that hearing will occur by Mr. Lichtenstein sharing with council public comment that has been received in connection with this ordinance. Thank you. The first comment we have is from Michael Straw, 499 West Jefferson Street, Apartment 507 Media. I wanted to comment on the proposal by, the De by Delaware County Council to change the residency requirement at this time to obtain employment within co the county government. I believe the county should oppose this change. Nicholas Finelli, Nicholas R. Finelli Jr., 811 Nailers Run Road, Havertown. Please vote no on reducing residency requirement to two years. Uh, another one with no street address. Another from Steve Haley, 422 St. David's Ave, Radnor, PA, 19087. Hire from within Delaware County, do not change any rules. Um, council, th the next is from Beth, Beth Stefanidi, 399 West Baltimore Avenue, Media PA. Um, the official county website advises, county council is chartered to be involved in activities for Delaware County pertaining to economic development of Delaware County. Council also decides the best means of providing services which are required by law or are necessary for the well-being of the county. If you are chartered, specifically to address economic development of this county and to decide the best means to do so. Please help explain how eliminating or changing the residency requirement of county employees furthers this mandate. Requiring county employees to live in the county directly benefits the Delaware County constituents you serve by giving them a paycheck. Requiring county employees to live in the county gives them a sense of pride in their work as they are doing their best for their hometown. Requiring employees to live in the county causes people to buy houses here, rent houses here, shop here, eat their lunch here, attend our schools, pay taxes to their schools, and pay our county taxes. What kind of economic to benefit to Delaware County is there to someone riding the train in and out from another county? You must be insinuating there are not enough local people interested in the county jobs. To the contrary, there are plenty of Delaware Countyans who could use a job, health insurance, a retirement account, and financial stability explain why you would want to give their jobs away. Revolving door of our county employees with no investment in these streets and hometowns is not the best way to provide economic well-being to Delaware County. Thank you for your consideration. 
Next is from Helene Conroy Smith, 32 Westwood Park Drive, Havertown, Deer County Council. Please do not consider reducing the residency requirement for county employees. By reducing it to only two years, the proposed ordinance would remove any incentive or mandate for county council to hire from within Delaware County. It is important to have people in the community working for the community. There have been detrimental changes in Delaware County lately, and I would like to see us work on taking care of our community. More changes are not necessary at this point. And that's the end of the comments that were specifically on the ordinance. Thank you. I guess we'll turn to uh, council then for any questions or comments from council. Yeah, I, I want to start by um, clarifying because based on the comments that we received, there seems to be a profound misunderstanding of what this ordinance does. Um, this ordinance is not meant to remove the residency requirement. It's not meant to reduce it to, uh, I don't even know what this means, but a two-year requirement. Um, that's not what it says. Uh, you know, and what it really is meant to do is to memorialize what has been common practice prior to this council taking office. And, and that is that you know, often there were exceptions being made to the residency requirement to accommodate people who um, had received a job and needed to move into the county to um, abide by the residency requirement. And so there were allowances to give some short amount of time, uh, and they truly are exceptions in order to move into the county. Um, so I, I personally, I, I can't speak for all of council, but I personally agree that the residency requirement is a good thing, that when we are uh, you know, incentivizing and encouraging and requiring people to live in Delaware County, to buy houses in Delaware County, to rent in Delaware County, to spend their money in Delaware County, to pay taxes here, then I think the comments are right on. I, I really believe that the positives um, outweigh um, any, you know, uh, downsides to having such a restriction. And, and I, maybe I wouldn't feel that way if we lived in, you know, some third rate county uh, or one that was small and didn't have the diversity of, of um, community options that we have within Delaware County, but we do. This is a very desirable place to live. And I, I agree, I think we should continue to have the residency requirement. We are not removing it. We are simply making sure that the practice that has gone on in Delaware County prior to our taking office doesn't continue in violation of our code. We wanna make sure that we are complying with the code and therefore having this ordinance allows us to do so. Yeah, I would uh, like to second what Mr. Madden said. Uh, this is really an ordinance that came about because this council was approached earlier this year, um, or I shouldn't say earlier this year, it was approached last year. Uh, about a met, about creating a waiver for a category of employees, meaning the the juvenile uh, detention center, where they were having difficulty finding credentialed employees to work there. There is a there was already a waiver like that in place in Fair Acres, where people have to be credentialed and have to have a certain certification to uh, to work in one of the skilled licensed positions. And in those instances, in the, in the case of Fair Acres in the past and in the case of, of the juvenile probation, um, or the, I'm sorry, the juvenile detention center, uh, council was asked by the hiring department to allow a waiver to the residency requirement because they simply couldn't find enough credentialed people in the county willing to work at the wages that the county had been offering, but they were informed by recruiters they were working with that there were people from Philadelphia, there were people outside the county. Um, there were other people with those credentials who might be interested in taking the job. I know at that time I had a conversation with our solicitor who said, you know, this is fine, except the charter, the, uh, not the charter, the code, the county code, which contains the residency requirement 
doesn't really give counsel the ability to exempt any classification of employees, no matter what the reason is. And upon looking at it said, and you know, this six month period where somebody who's hired, who does not reside in the county, can sign an affidavit promising they'll move into the county within six months at the risk of being dismissed from their job. There's nothing in the code that allows you to do that either. All this ordinance, and, by, and that had been a standard that is a standard practice in Delaware County, not that it comes up all that often that somebody's hired from outside the county, um, outside of the juvenile uh, detention center or um, Fair Acres. What this ordinance is trying to do is make sure that our county code represents what the practices are in the county, which is to say, maintain the residency requirement, but allow a little bit of flexibility so that if we recruit people who want to work here and want to be part of this community, and they're by far the best people we can find, the job is conditioned upon their agreement to move in. Or if there are some jobs where the need for qualified individuals outstrips the supply that we can give our hiring departments a waiver for some period of time to fill those positions. So this is really just meant to memorialize an existing practice. And um, I agree with Mr. Madden. I think people, um, I, think, I think right now at a time when people need jobs in this county, it's, it's important that we maintain this residency requirement. And that is what this does. It simply documents longstanding practice. And so I, I support making sure that the county, by doing what the county has been doing for years, long before I got on the board, um, doesn't violate the county's own ordinance. And that's all we're trying to do here. I will go next. I, um, in my opinion, the residency requirement is not in the best interest of our residents and our county. And let me explain. I totally agree that having our residents work for us is a benefit. We want our workforce to be full of our residents. Um, and I agree with all of the reasons for that. They have skin in the game. They know the county better than others. They spend their money in the county. They buy their houses in the county. That is all benefit. Totally acknowledge it, embrace it. I think we all agree on that. You can achieve that though, without also taking on the negative impact of the res mandated resi residency requirement by making it a hiring preference. And that way you hire, if, if you have two candidates that are equal and one lives in Delaware County, you hire the Delaware County person. But when you make the residency requirement mandatory, it creates problems. We know that, we've seen it. We have whole departments that are waived. We have this patchwork of, of waiver, wavering and it, it's confusing and it's unnecessarily complicated. We can adopt the policy that Delaware County residents are, are preferred for hiring and, and, and always hire the Delaware County person that comes in for that job if they're equally qualified. Um, but I, in my opinion, the, there are negative, there are neg there's a negative impact of this requirement that we've been dealing with for a year now. And I don't think it's gonna get any better. I think when we are in charge of the prison, I think we're going to be facing that same problem again. And we're going to end up doing a, a, a system waiver for that as well. So instead of coming at this backwards, let's make, let's declare Delaware County residents are preferred in our hiring practices, always will be. We want our Delaware County residents to, to work here. But having it mandatory is not the way to go about it. We lose talent in, in places where, um, and when that has happened, we have seen it happen. All of us have seen it happen. And we have trouble staffing and, and end up with all of these exceptions and waivers. So that would be my approach. Um, 
I, I'm not going to support this uh, this amendment today because I, I just think we're, it's going down the wrong road. I don't think that I have support to repeal the resident residency requirement at this point, but I will ask my my colleagues that as we continue to look at our administrative code uh, and reassess it, that we continue to think about the merits of having this mandatory requirement that it hasn't really worked for us. And, and I think the history has shown that in the way it's been applied. Um, but I just wanna end with, I completely agree that we wanna hire Delaware County residents, absolutely every time. I guess just for me, from my point of view, I just wanted to echo kind of what Mr. Madden and Ms. Ruther were saying. Uh, I think some of this, these comments were, they think they had the wrong idea of what we were doing here today. And we're just trying to memorialize what w the common practice has been. We are still keeping the residency requirement. And I do believe that we should be keeping that as one of the largest employers in the county. I think individuals who work for the county should be from the county and have a vested interest in our county. Um, I am, I understand what Ms. Schaefer is saying about us being limited a little bit. I do think that the expansion of our HR department and doing more targeted hiring practices and trying to really get more individuals involved in understanding when we have jobs available at the county, I think that, that is gonna help us be able to reach a broader network within our county. And I do think that there is room for waivers when we have really specialized positions that maybe we can't fill or we can't find somebody first from in the county, then we can go with outside. But for me, I think the residency requirement is important to have. I think, I guess I'll offer my perspective. Um, and I'll start by saying that in my, in my night job where I run a private enterprise, um, we don't, we have a very limited uh, focus and purpose in that, and that is to make as much money as possible, right? We're not trying to serve some greater societal good. You know, hopefully in, in, in that process, we do serve a greater societal good, but that's for a longer conversation. Um, but when we're in such an environment, we don't try to hire people who live, you know, in a close proximity to our office, except insofar as we think that will benefit us in retaining that person. We look for the most qualified person because we know that person will do the best job for us. And if we were to constrain our, our search, I think we would um, diminish the likelihood that we optimize our workforce. So when, and some of those positions are harder to find than others. So when you're looking for an actuary for the very specific kind of reinsurance I do, you have to look far afield. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think it's a secret that my office is in South Jersey where I, uh, uh, where I work. But uh, when we needed to find such a specialized uh, um, actuary, we looked far and, and wide. And as you might imagine, where did we find them? We found them in Delaware County. So we hired somebody from Upper Darby, who is now our rock star of an actuary. Um, but um, you know, here in Delaware County, we have a slightly different balance here. We, we are trying to achieve something, dual things at the same time. On the one hand, we want to have the best workforce possible so that the services we provide for our citizens are optimized. Right, that is, that is clearly a benefit to all of our citizens. On the other hand, we also have a competing concern that I don't have in my other night job where we have a larger societal goal and that is to you know, advance the interests of Delaware County to keep dollars here that, uh, that come from here. And so for me, you know, I think um, it comes down to, I think this, this, uh, this way of acting where we do have a re residency requirement, but we allow people time to move into the county if they're not already here serves that end. It, balance, it meets those balances. We still maintain a residency requirement. And I am confident that 99% of the jobs that we fill here in Delaware County will be feel, filled by people who currently live in the county. There are going to be some instances where we can't find uh, folks to fill those jobs. And in those instances, we would hire people from outside of the county and give them time to move into our, uh, to our fair land. So I think, uh, I think this is a fair compromise. And as others have said, you know, this has been going on for years and years and years. Uh, this ain't nothing new uh, as to how the county is run. And, and, and there, have, there are many instances where Kevin and I would, would speak over the last two years and we'd say, that person hasn't lived in Delaware County and they've been working here for like decades. How does that work? Uh, you know, so the, 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 the code and the practice were very different. And I think that's, 
that's not a good way to operate, right? There's a reason to have a rule book and uh, we should have a rule book that, that uh, both um, sort of codifies best practices that we wanna follow in the county and then that enables us to actually follow those rules. So I am in support of this. Um, I do recognize the competing considerations, but I think this is a pretty good, uh, a pretty good, pretty good way to get there. Any other questions or comments from council? This is just one question. There have been a, um, Solicitor Martin, there have been a number of public comments that came in during this debate. Would you like me to read them at this point on this, on this ordinance? Quantifying number. <laughs> um, four. Yeah, please. Uh, I, I think we'd be well served by hearing them. I, yeah, I, I want to make sure people have a chance to be heard. And I think, um, I think though, for, for fairness, that after reading these comments, that will technically end the um, solicitor Martin, you agree that would end yep. the hearing portion? Yes. Okay. Um, there, there's one again without a full address. Peter F. Kane, 8003 Arlington Avenue, Upper Darby, PA. Last year in Upper Darby Township, the Township Council voted to remove the residency requirements for elected officials. Residency requirements are there for a purpose so that the person seeking the elected office knows the challenges, economy, and the people of any state, county, or municipality. I believe a minimum of, of five years of residency in Delaware County is agreed for a candidate to run for office. Lowering the residency requirement would put Delaware County on a more dangerous path like it is already now, like it already is now. It, it, just to respond to this, this has nothing to do with elected officials. Um, there, There is... A, all elected officials must be residents of the county when they are elected. So this is this is not changing that at all. I would go one step further. All elected officials must reside in the county, and if they move out, they have to resign for their position as an elected official. So it's, and that's a matter of of um, I, I believe both our county charter and the and the state uh, county code. And I believe two years prior to running, but I could be wrong on that. It may be a one year residency requirement. <coughs> The next comment's from Maureen Williams, 8620 South Eagle Road, Havertown. Preference should be given to hiring Delaware County residents. Please do not change the residency requirement for county employees. I believe this will remove any incentive or mandate for county council to hire from within Delaware County. And then the final comment again does not have even have a name, let alone an address. And that concludes the public comments on this uh, ordinance. All right, thank you, Mr. Lichtenstein. I'll give uh, council one last bite at the apple if anybody cares to offer any other comments. I just, I just wanna reiterate, we are retaining the residency requirement. We are codifying the exceptions or not the exceptions, but the flexibility that's been given to allow people to be hired from outside on the condition that they move in within a stated period of time. And we are codifying the ability or the that the power that council has exercised sort of outside the statute to waive it for certain employment classifications that in both cases that I'm aware of where it was waived required specific licensing that they had difficulty recruiting for finding enough people in Delaware County. But that's, we're not changing the practice, we're changing the law to be consistent with the practice and we're keeping the residency requirement. All right, if there's nothing further, all those in favor of adopting ordinance 20. And I think we have to go. Uh, You're right. Thank yeah, you, Mr. Madden. Okay, Ms. Ruther. Aye. Ms. Schaefer. Nay. Mr. Madden? Aye. Dr. Taylor? Aye. Chairman Zydek? Aye. The motion passes four to one. All right, thank you, Dr. Taylor. Agenda item number seven, motion for approval of resolution 2021-1, authorizing the establishment of the Delaware County Department of Health as a single county Department of Health pursuant to the Pennsylvania Local Health Administration Law. Second. 
Thank you. We have Mr. Lichtenstein here to present uh, this, I believe. Um, yes, um, this, this resolution is the first um, official step for the county to, or towards starting the process to establish a um, local health, a county health department under the, um, under the Pennsylvania law. Um, the, fir the first step was for um, the Pennsylvania Department of Health to give a certificate of approval, which they did. Um, the next step then is for county council to authorize the establishment. There's then a long process that you go through under the law to establish a board of health, hire a health director, um, get the department up and running. And by, uh, by adopting this resolution, um, that's the authorization to start that process. Thank you, Mr. Lichtenstein. Any questions or comments from council? I just wanted to say thank you, Mr. Lichtenstein, for helping us put the resolution together. And then, of course, oh. thank you, Council, and thank you to our steering committee who has continued to keep pushing us along this track and help us to meet all these milestones. This is a really important first, a really important, not first step, really important step, though, in the process for us to open our health department in time for January of 2022. All that. I and also, uh, thank you, Dr. Taylor, for your ongoing leadership in this area. Uh, we're, we're very appreciative of everything you've done behind the scenes, helping to get us where we are today. Yeah, I, I would like to thank um, Dr. Taylor. I'd like to thank the staff who has been working on um, making this come about. Uh, it has involved um, a lot of nitty gritty boots on the ground kind of stuff. It's involved a lot of much higher level strategic planning and analysis, and it has truly taken the village. It's been something that, um, you know, I know um, Ms. Schaefer, Dr. Taylor and I, you ran on this and worked, have been working on this and we're working on this well before uh, COVID sort of illustrated why it is so essential to have this in place. And um, I'm just grateful for the work everybody has done to make this happen. And, um, and the, there's some additional news I know too in the governor's address about even uh, his budget even provides the funding for it. So <laughs> one more thing to be grateful for. I just wanna pile on by, by noting and having everyone recognize that this is on schedule. And despite the pandemic, the steering committee got this done and has this on schedule to, op to, to have this up and running within the schedule that we had hoped for. And just to, to add on to that, Dr. Taylor not only spearheaded this through the pandemic, she also had a baby while this all happened. So I just want to say it is absolutely incredible that we are, are on schedule, good to go, and um, despite so much going on. Giving birth to people and a health department in one year, that is uh, quite, uh, quite something. I, I will note uh, for the record too that um, Mr. Madden and I also campaigned on this and at least as far back as 2009, when David Landau ran, he was campaigning on it. This has been something that people have campaigned on for you know decades. And um, unfortunately, it, uh, we weren't able to get it the ball rolling until January of 2019. And uh, as luck would have it, a pandemic started two months later. So unfortunately for the county, this was not put into place earlier. I think we'd be in a far better place than we are today had this been, been there, but we're not crying over spilled milk, we're uh, charging ahead and doing what we can to uh, make sure that we're prepared for the next one uh, uh, that's gonna occur like 150 years from now. Um, and also to make sure that all the good things that a county health department provides for its citizen is in place as soon as it can be. I think the controller, the district attorney, I think they ran on it as well. Everyone ran on this, hmm. at least uh, in the last couple of years they did. Yeah. All right, if there's nothing further than uh, all those in favor of agenda item number seven, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it.
Agenda item number eight, motion for approval to accept grant from the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency for the term October 1, 2020 to September 30th, 2023 in the amount of $668,958 to support senior victim services. Subject to solicitor's approval. Second. We have a motion and a second, and we have our district attorney, Mr. Stolsteimer, with us this evening. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I know we spoke about this uh, yesterday, so I'll just be very brief, but I'm very happy that we have been able to acquire this grant. Um, these are the funds, there are two grants, a federal grant and a state grant, uh, that reimburse the county for the District Attorney's Office of Senior Victim Services. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, this is an off-site uh, operation that employs four people who are supposed to be providing services to senior citizens who are victims of crime. Um, it's unfortunate to have to say this, but um, my, the previous administration, the, the person who was in charge of running this office simply didn't do her job uh, and left us with a financial mess. In fact, that person quit before even telling me that she was quitting when I came into office. Um, thankfully, we were able to get this grant money in large part because our controller has stepped up and helped us figure out the financial mess. And we worked our way through that and we've gotten PCCD to give us this money uh, to continue the operation moving forward. So I wanna thank uh, Controller Phillips for all the work she and her staff have done over the last several months. And also, Mr. Zydek, I would also just say that we are trying to fix this management problem because, again, it's an off-site location. Uh, we are working with uh, Women Against Rape, one of the oldest and most uh, impressive uh, victims assistance organizations in Delaware County. They are very interested in their board is entertaining the motion of taking this over and bringing this office into their wide-ranging victim services operation, they would take over the specific function of offering and, and hiring these employees to continue the service to senior victims. Uh, so hopefully we'll be presenting that to you if everything goes right later in the spring and, and showing you why we think that's a good idea that we won't have these management problems again and we'll be able to offer even better services to victims of violent crime in, in Delaware County. So I would long-winded, but I would ask you to please accept this grant. Thank you, Mr. Stolzheimer. Any questions or comments from council? I just want to repeat the comment that I made in our meeting yesterday, which is that I appreciate uh, the effort that's that's gone into getting this grant and the fact that there has been discussion about actually uh, building a relationship with you know one of our premier uh, victim advocacy organizations to ultimately move this service out of the DA's office. Because for people who work uh, with victims of crime, you know, a lot of them are also under investigation for criminal actions. That's what happens when you have um, sex trafficking in a community or when you have um, substance abuse disorder fueling criminal activity. And um, I think making a third party the lead on victim advocates instead of leaving it within the law enforcement community. It allows, it gives the law enforcement community a partner without intimidating people who might otherwise be concerned about coming forward. So I applaud your initiative in doing that and uh, thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you very much. Um, I guess I would only say that uh, back when I was a young attorney, when I had a little more hair, I actually worked for legal services in the Senior Citizens Advocacy Center and uh, was just appalled at the, the, uh, the ways in which um, the predators preyed on senior citizens. So I'm, um, this is a very important grant. It is, it is necessary to protect some of our most vulnerable citizens. And uh, if we can do it, if we can advocate for a way for it to be done more efficiently, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all for that and I appreciate your work on this. Thank you, sir. If there's nothing further, all those in favor of agenda item number eight, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Agenda item number nine, motion for approval of addendum A to the professional services agreement dated November 13th, 2021 with Mission Partners Group, LLC for the term November 9, 2020 to June 30th, 2021, increasing the total contract amount by $4,295 for a total not to exceed $120,000 $20,047. Uh, this is subject to solicitor approval. Second. Second. We have Mr. Stolsteimer with us here. 
<laughs> yes, sir. Uh, so this is a, a contract that uh, is funded by a grant. We got a safe schools grant from uh, the uh, Del uh, Pennsylvania Department of Community Education, uh, Community Development, excuse me. So this is a legislative grant. It was not a competitive grant. Um, we're using part of that funding to do a joint initiative between County Council and the District Attorney's Office in place of the old safe school summits that we had done in the past. Um, the last one that was an in-person safe school summit really, I think, got to the core of issues that educators really cared about, which is how we can better deliver uh, behavioral and mental health um, services in the schools to children who need them. Uh, and so Dr. Taylor and Mr. Madden have agreed, and they've been sitting on a steering committee uh, we've hired a consultant, the, the, the folks who are uh, under contract here in this uh, in initiative, uh, to start interviewing and developing, hopefully, a plan that we'll be able to present to council later this fall about how we can you know, evaluate how good a job we're doing at delivering those services now, and maybe even ways we can improve that. So that's the goal. Um, this is a small uh, addendum to the contract because as we're finding out with the pandemic, some of the costs have already risen. Uh, for the for the uh, firm that's doing the consulting work. So I would humbly ask if we could increase the amount. This is more than the amount of money we have left in the overall grant. Thank you. Any questions or comments from council? I just want to say thank you again, Mr. Solzheimer, for taking this on and also applying the grant funding towards it so that we can push this project forward. Uh, this group has been excellent thus far, and this project will really help us to streamline our services and um, make it more efficient, more coordinated, and also fill those gaps that we know are there and exist in the system. So thank you so much for working on this and putting this project together. And, and thank you, Dr. Taylor, for being part of it. As Mr. Zydek noted, you gave birth to a child in a health center this year, and you're also helping us keep schools safe. So we greatly appreciate everything you're doing. If there's nothing further, all those in favor of agenda item number nine, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Yeah, I have it. Thank you, Mr. Solsteimer. Thank you. Thank you all. Agenda item number 10, motion for approval of agreements, contracts, and amendments with the human services providers of services as per the attached list, subject to solicitor's approval. Second. Good evening, Ms. Garrison. Good evening. The first two requests I have is for permission to issue a request for proposal. Both are with the Children and Youth Services Program. The first is for a provider to uh, manage and oversee the safe care services for um, children. This was implemented as a result of the uh, Comprehensive Treatment and Recovery Act. And basically what it says is if child under the year of one is exposed to substances, either the parents are taking prescriptions when pregnant or obviously illicit substances, that child has to be evaluated and that has to be maintained and so forth. So this would be for a provider to oversee that program. The second request is for a transitional housing services. We currently do this service, um, however, you know, to be prudent, we wanted to RFP to see if there's other providers out there that do it. Um, as I stated yesterday, and this is one of my statistics I like with human services, we actually have never placed a child in children use services due strictly to parents' homelessness or inability to find some type of residence or stable housing. Um, the next request is to apply for a grant for the systems of care funds. Um, if awarded, we could receive up to $275 per year for four years. Um, this, we are looking at doing having different peer specialists, either a family peer specialist for families that come through human services, um, as well as a peer specialist for the youth, um, and also a navigator to assist people to maneuver through our systems, as we've discussed numerous times. Our system's going to be cumbersome and burdening, burdening if you do not know how to maneuver through them, so this would help those individuals coming in, obviously, at time of crisis and how to get the services that they need. Um, the next three requests are for the Opioid Housing Initiative Grant. The first two are to accept the funding. Um, we did accept, uh, with council's permission, a ex no-cost extension for year two of the grant. The state has now come back and said there's $155,478 that can come to the county for that program. Um, I know we discussed it yesterday. The contract actually for community action, I misspoke yesterday, was not amended for that. We do have that slated for an upcoming council meeting. Um, that grant, that contract is through Adult and Family Services. Initially, when we applied for these monies, we applied with the conjunction between Adult and Family Services and Drug and Alcohol. Um, now, the, all those funds have been switched to the State Department of Drug and Alcohol, which is why the request for the contract for the 699000 
is with Community Action, it's a drug and alcohol contract. Um, and that is for year three of the grant, which is the other request is to accept those funds. Um, I would also ask that the contract with Cornell Abraxas be amended to add a um, GPS monitoring service. Um, the contract with diversified treatment, I'd ask that that be amended to reflect their current rate. And finally, I'd ask that we enter into agreement with the listed early learning resource center providers for the subsidized day care program within the county. Thank you, Ms. Garrison. Any questions or comments from council? I just have a, one question about the system of care grant from yes. Sam Hassa, however you say it. <laughs> Sam. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's, two, that's for four years. So that's basically a, a million dollar grant. Mm -hmm. Have we gotten that before? We have not. We have a system of care funds, the smaller amount. Um, that Those monies filter through the state to us. This, if we have permission to apply, will be directly to the federal government to receive these monies. Um, so we do the amount, I believe, and I can double check, I believe it's around 75000 is what we've received in the past. So this is new funds. Right. That's great. And how competitive is it? How confident are we? Um, hopefully. I mean, I think we are wonderful in human services in Delaware County. Um, I think we have, I think our plan is going to be well written. I think there's a lot of good ideas. I do think this is a much needed service. So I, I think it's somewhat competitive, but I think we definitely have a good plan put together. Put together. Great. Great news. Thanks. I feel sorry for anybody else competing against us. I do too. <laughs> Any other questions or comments from council? Right, hearing on all those in favor of agenda item number 10, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you, Ms. Garrison. Agenda item number 11 calls for an update on the Federal Emergency Rental Assistance Program. Sorry, Ms. Garrison, you're still with us. I didn't mean to <laughs> wish you a good evening too early. Sorry <laughs> about that. We have Ms. Garrison uh, and uh, I'm not sure who else uh, is presenting this. Maybe Lori Devon? Mr. Lichtenstein. Mr. Lichtenstein is, okay, yes. <laughs> um, as council is aware, we did put in as a county for the direct funding for the um, rent relief program and we were awarded $16.9 million. Um, we've been meeting internally with a team of myself, Mr. Lichtenstein, Adult and Family Services Administrator, Jessica Fink, um, and Linda Hill from the Office of Housing and Community Development. And we recently pulled in Frank Bellotta because there are some IT concerns with this and some software that that is out there that we're evaluating. Mr. Martin has also been involved in these discussions. At this point, we're looking to maintain the program in-house. Um, we're hopeful that if we have a consultant and then several temporary staff to assist in managing it, that we would be able to do it in-house. We're looking at having there be an on-site location in our offices in Upper Darby, as well as the county offices at the Baldwin Tower to have places on both ends of the county that people come and apply for this assistance. Um, we've been speaking with various um, counterparts in other counties to see how they're managing similar programs to get some ideas. Um, I know Mr. Martin spoke with the court to get an idea of how many current eviction filings there are to have those that have filed, I believe January 31st was the date. Anything that's filed January 31st or earlier would be given priority. Um, and we are also, like you said, evaluating some software programs to manage this as well to assist us. Um, we're looking at using an outside payroll company that's currently used in human services and fairness to Ms. Phillips and her office, the number of checks that will have to be cut. Um, it doesn't seem that without ha having additional staff with them, it doesn't seem that it's something that's feasible. Um, we've used this provider in the past and we can upload to their system, so it should be relatively smooth. Um, obviously, we'll make sure proper controls are in place and work with the controller's office to make sure we are covering all of our bases. And I know there's state funds that are coming in as well, and Mr. Lichtenstein can provide an update on those funds. Thank you. The, the state, at least under the current Senate bill, has determined rather than running a separate program to simply pass through um, all the federal funds to the different counties on a pro rata uh, basis based on population. Um, the latest estimate I got is that that actually could be a considerable amount for Delaware County. It could be upwards of 20 million. Um, again, that's, that's based on the current legislation that still hasn't been passed and the current reading of it. Um, it would generally not have that many additional restrictions. The program would generally follow the, just the federal restrictions, which are the same restrictions we, that come with the direct money from the federal government. 
Um, they believe they have a slightly faster spend down required. They want to know about the spend down in August as opposed to the end of September, which is the federal requirement to have spent 65% of your funds, which then makes you eligible to get additional monies. Um, there is a 2% cap on costs of administering the program, whereas the federal cap is only 10%. Um, so that would be a big change. Um, there would also need to be, because there's, for the state money, we would be reporting to the state. For the federal money, we're reporting directly to Treasury. Um, we would need to have an ability to track um, two different pots of money for the same purpose. Um, so far, the two software providers we've talked to, and we're going to talk to a third next week, have both assured us that their systems are set up to be able to track multiple sources of money and report separately on them. Um, and then I think I'd defer for a minute to Solicitor Martin. I, I don't know if you have more information on the, the working with the courts on the current current eviction cases. As I indicated yesterday, there's there are um, in the range of six to 800 pending eviction cases in the county, um, either uh, at the magistrate court level or at the common pleas level. Uh, certain ones are in the common pleas system um, subject to uh, mediation. And these matters would be given precedent uh, to, um, in connection with the distribution of the funds so that uh, we can both protect the continued occupancy of those tenants and also effectively help clear the docket of the courts of those pending cases. Uh, that intended preference only will apply to cases that were filed through January 31. Uh, we don't want to artificially incent anybody uh, to file eviction proceedings. Uh, but as Mr. Lichtenstein indicated, the program is structured to incent jurisdictions to push money out to beneficiaries uh, either by August or September, whether we're talking about the state money or the federal money, so that uh, this group um, will be um, coming back to council in relatively short order with um, a more precise set of program parameters and also will be publicizing those more broadly in the county so that we can um, receive the applications from both tenants and landlords so we know the pool of beneficiaries that can be processed to make sure efficient and quick use of the money is made. Well, I would just like to say this this is one going to be one of the most important programs that we run through this um, pandemic. And, you know, it's been 10 months now, 11 months that there's been a moratorium in place protecting us against mayhem. Uh, but uh, when that's lifted, you know, without this program, without this financial help, um, we would have a really big problem on our hand and a, a huge um, homeless or newly homeless um, sector of the population. And that may sound like a lot of money, $16 million and maybe 20 million more, but I don't, th I don't think that's even going to address the need. Um, 800 evictions in the court system right now, that's crazy. That's during a moratorium of, on evictions. So um, I, I think that, you know, I, I'm really pleased at the direction this is taken. I, I like the hybrid um, addressing what's in the courts right now and also pushing out through the, the, our, um, our human services programming. I do just wanna, um, one more time, I did this yesterday, but I really want to make sure that we concentrate and focus on trying to get this, this aid and the word about this aid and help in, in getting this aid to our most vulnerable populations who are sometimes not English speaking, sometimes not in a uh, payroll economy, sometimes they're in a cash economy, uh, and they, they are really at risk right now, that population, um, especially when the moratorium is lifted. So uh, we really have to work hard to make sure we reach them. But thank you, this is, so far this is looking great and I have, have high hopes for this program. Thank you, Sandy. Do we have a sense of the, um, 
of the scale of need. Uh, you know, if it, for instance, if there are 800 cases currently in the system, what's the average amount in dispute? Is it, you know, 2,000, 20,000? Um, and, and how many others might be out there? Do we have a means to even try to gather that? We are talking with one of the consultants that we use for the CARES Act funds already about possibly completing a needs assessment so we can get a better handle on that. Um, we're not 100% sure. I mean, we can do estimates based on the number of individuals unemployed, a percentage of individuals employed now versus, you know, a year and a half ago and look, kind of get a gauge on that, but to get a really true number, we're not really sure. And like Councilman Schaefer mentioned, there's also individuals that wouldn't really fall into those statistics probably that are going to need this money. So hopefully other, when we come back, we'll have a much better idea of the scale. In terms of the size of, of the um, benefit that can go out, it's worth pointing out that the there's a requirement to prioritize uh, tenants whose income is at 50% or less of the adjusted media, median income for the county. And then service can also be provided to tenants up to 80% of the adjusted median income. And benefits are only going back to the middle of March of 2020. So part of the sizing of any particular individual recipient's benefit can sort of be anticipated if you think about what might be the standard or average rent for somebody at that income level. And then you're going back a maximum uh, of 11 months or 10, 10 to 11 months uh, from this period of time. So you're, you're, you're probably not dealing with people who's, who are paying 2,500 or 3,500 a month in rent. You're, you're more likely dealing with people uh, with a lower monthly base rent a rearage that you're trying to address. Fair enough, and I, I think you spoke yesterday, maybe maybe earlier today too, and I, and I missed it. That that part of the settlement, if, if the landlord and the tenant come to an agreement and payment is made to the landlord, that it has to sort of wipe the slate clean. That that's uh, that resolves any 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 dispute that would otherwise be outstanding between the landlord and the tenant. Correct. Correct. the The program will be structured so that in receiving this benefit, the landlord is acknowledging that the payment is in full compensation of the past due rent uh, for the covered period. Uh, we don't want to make a payment and then have somebody come back and say, you know, there were there were late check fees or bounce check fees or things like that that would um, th that would work against the intent of the program. The intent of the program is. That folks that the payment is made, and then the tenant is working from a fresh, a fresh slate going forward. Okay. Yeah, and I guess that it's important, I think, for us to figure out what the total needs are if we're going to figure out sort of what negotiating posture we're going to have. Um, you know, if we if if we only have half as much money as we need, then we might start by saying, look, we're going to pay half of what's what's outstanding, so we can cover all these folks. But you know, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that many of these landlords are residents of Delaware County as well. So it's it's uh, and we want them to keep their housing stock up, and you know, so um, we want to cut a good deal for for everybody. But certainly, um, my own primary motivation is to make sure that people are able to stay in their homes. And we have to make sure that what is being offered is at a level that will attract the landlords into the program, because if the you know, while the payment certainly may not be a hundred cents on a dollar, if the payment is too low. Um, you may cause the, the landlords not to take advantage of it and just to proceed with the eviction. I mean, that, that was essentially our problem, Mr. Martin, wasn't it, with the federal relief that was offered um, or the state, I'm sorry, the state's program that was available in the spring. I mean, you're offering somebody who has to accept $750 a month regardless. You know, it doesn't matter if somebody's renting a whole house um, you know, that might be a 1500 a month rental plus utilities, you've got to accept that, that capped amount. So there's, there's an ability to do, I mean, I think the flexibility that you're talking about here is, is important. Yes. Just back of the envelope. If you, if you assume a thousand dollars a month as an average rent for a year, that's $12,000 March to March. 
times 800 cases we know of right now, that's $16 million right there. I, you might want to double check that one. No? <laughs> 16. I think well, that would be 9.6 maybe. This is why you don't do back of the envelope math. In any case, it's a lot of money. So that's 12,000 times 800, 9,600,000, 9, 9, 9, so. So a lot of the, it would swallow up a lot of the available funds. Right, and I would assume that there are a lot more out there since there's been a moratorium on evictions. All right, any other uh, questions or comments from council? All right, hearing none, all those. Oh, I guess we're not, we're not voting on anything. So thank you for the update. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Ms. Garrison. Good evening. Agenda item number 12, motion for approval, uh, authorization to purchase four Chrysler Pacifica hybrid minivans uh, from Video Chrysler Dodge in Newtown Square off CoStar's contract 013-021 for a price not to exceed $144,588, subject to solicitor's approval. Second. We have a second, we have Mr. Hudak. I assume that's uh, Vidian, is it? Vidian, Vidian. Uh, Vidian, yeah, so I might just uh, put an N on the end of that um, uh, for, the, for the record. But Mr. Hudak, take it away. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if, if approved, uh, this purchase would be through a Delaware County dealership on the CoStars contract. Um, sticking with the initiative, it'll be a plug-in hybrid. Uh, if used correctly and plugged in uh, and uh, charged uh, with the charging stations that the county is going to get to install, it should offset the cost, the additional cost of buying the hybrid motor versus the gasoline motor. Uh, these vehicles are replacement vehicles uh, for CYS. Two were totaled in accidents and two were higher mileage uh, minivans uh, that transport uh, multiple children. Um, state funding is about 85%. Uh, the county funding is about 15. I think Ms. Garrison sent something over to um, just clarify the state funding as far as you know what, what was being uh, what we were able to purchase with the state funding. Um, so I, I don't know if you had any questions about that. No, I just, I want to clarify. I think what you're saying is that the, the difference in cost is about equal to uh, one year's worth of gas savings. So, uh, you know, in theory, we're going to be hopefully having these vehicles longer than one year. So the, the payback is one year, but we'll, we'll save money in future years versus that Delta in the first year. Yes. Um, so it's a pretty good in, in return on our investment as well as the environmental reasons for switching. Any other questions or comments from council? All right, hearing none, all those in favor of agenda item number 12, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you, Mr. Hudak. Thank you. Good night. Agenda item number 13, motion for approval of amendment to contract E-62320 between the County of Delaware and RoadCon in an amount of $10,419.75 to conduct preventative maintenance for bridge number 16, Media Station Road, due to changes in the scope of work. Subject to solicitor's approval. Second. Good evening, Mr. Beerling. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of council. I'm here today to ask for the approval of an amendment to the contract number E62320, County of Delaware and Road Con Incorporate 902 um, Camaro Drive and Westchester PA 19380 to conduct preventive maintenance for bridge number 16, Media Station Road, due to unforeseen conditions in the scope of the work. Sidewalk repair changes in the in the field from the original plans at a cost of ten thousand four hundred nineteen dollars and seventy five cents. 
subject to the solicitor's approval. The first part that was not planned was existing paving on Media Station Road. This was done to incorporate a utility patch and would stop the um, blacktop from potholing and stuff. By not extending the paving, water could have easily gotten infiltrated under the new paving and created potholes. During this process, we increased the milling cost plus the tack coat, warm asphalt mix, and line striping. The second was we had to change the scope of uh, work in the sidewalk repair. Once excavation had started, we realized that the sidewalk was not planned at four inches as we thought, but rather eight to 10 inches thick. Because of this, we had to change the scope of work and we repair the, uh, from being a, a removal to a, a milling of the sidewalk and adding a binding agent, replacing the concrete. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Beerling. Any questions from council? All right, hearing none, all those in favor of agenda item number 13, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you, Mr. Beerling. Thank you, sir. Good evening. Agenda item number 14, motion for approval of lease agreement for 19.103 square feet in building seven Northwest wing at Fair Acres Nursing Geriatric Center with Crozier Keystone Hospital for hospice care use for an initial term of one, 120 days at a monthly rent of $52,533.25 subject to solicitor's approval. Second. Second. We have Mr. D'Amico here to present this agenda item. Yes, good evening, Council. This uh, lease came about when Crozier reached out to Fair Acres to request vacant space. The reasoning they told us was due to the rising COVID-19 numbers at the hospital. They decided to search for satellite locations for certain departments within their healthcare organization to create more space to handle the influx of COVID-19 patients. With Council's approval, this unit will be used as an inpatient hospice unit Fair Acres did apply for a special exception with the uh, Department of Health, which was granted in order to operate, and a lease was discussed between both parties' solicitor's department. As stated earlier, this lease is for an initial term of 120 days with hopes of it leading into a possible longer-term lease to generate revenue and make a wider range of services here at Fair Acres campus. Thank you. Any questions or comments from council? All right, hearing none. All those in favor of agenda item number 14, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you, Mr. D'Amico. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Agenda item number 15, motion for approval of a grant agreement between the County of Delaware, Department of Intercommunity Health, and the Department of Environmental Protection for the Mosquito Borne Disease Control Program, effective January 1, 2021 through December 31st, 2021, in the amount of $156,508.51, subject mm -hmm. to solicitor's approval. Second. We have a motion and a second, and we have Ms. Devlin here to present this. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, Ms. Devlin. She's either holding really still. There she is. Ms. Uh, Devlin. I'm sorry. I was, I, I, my sound was off, so excuse me. That's right. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of council. I'm asking for your approval tonight of this grant. Um, it's an agreement between uh, the county and the Department of Environmental Protection. Um, this allows us to continue our work annually uh, for our um, West Nile and Tick surveillance um, program that runs basically from April through October each season. Um, we've worked with the DEP for the last over 20 years and um, this successful program. Um, it's really um, the the um, staff that is covered under this grant. So we have a a, uh, a, a controller that uh, that works with this program, and we have two technicians that are also part of this program. So the the funding for those um, positions are covered, as well as the um, the the uh, equipment and supplies that we use during the the program. 
Thank you, Ms. Devlin. Any questions or comments from council? Uh, Lori, just kind of a, Ms. Devlin, just kind of a random question. So it's my understanding that this is one of the programs that would then fall underneath of the health department. And so with this additional grant funding on top of like our Act 315 in the environmental section of the health department? That is correct. This program would be supported in our health department. Um, it probably would, um, the staffing for this, uh, they, obviously they would be county employees. Right now we, we contract um, for uh, seasonal employees for this program for the, you know, the technicians. So they would be employees of the county and they basically would work in this program um, seasonally and then they would work in other sections of the environmental program throughout the rest of the year. Okay, thank you. If there's nothing further, all those in favor of agenda item number 15, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you, Ms. Devlin. You have a good evening. Mr. Um, Chair, Mr. Chairman, can I interrupt real quick? I had understood that there was a possibility that one of the members might want to suggest an amendment to the agenda to add a new item. And if that is going to occur, it probably should occur now. Uh, that that is uh, very good timing, Mr. Martin. Since I I previously uh, emailed Mr. Zydek saying I was going to um, duck in after item number fifteen to uh, suggest a proposed amendment to the agenda. Um, if, if if everybody would uh, entertain me for a second here, um, the Act seventy seven. One of the things that it did when it uh, created um, no excuse mail-in voting was it created a category of um, permanent mail-in voting ballot application recipient. So somebody could de designate themselves as uh, annually, you know, saying that every year, you couldn't say I permanently want to be a mail-in voter and then just get your ballot automatically. But what you could do is say, I want the county to send me a mail-in ballot application every year. And um, it is in fact the counties who are responsible for sending that out, not the state. Uh, that the deadline, the statutory deadline um, without any penalties or uh, a great deal of fanfare for doing this for the first time ever was uh, Monday, uh, this past Monday. Um, Delaware County became aware of this late uh, and um, has in fact been sort of trying to find some ways to streamline the process and clarify the rather obtuse notice that we received from the state. Um, but we are in a position to get this mailed out. And um, I, if I could, I'd like to amend the agenda to add the approval of a contract with a co-stars printer for uh, the purpose of um, printing and mailing the um, uh, the absentee ballot applications to those who check the box to receive one annually. Um, in amending the agenda. Yes, so I would like to amend the agenda to do that. I'd like to make a motion to amend the agenda to add this contract with proposed vendor RBM Consulting, um, CoStar's vendor number 362724 for a contract amount uh, of $63,900 um, subject to the approval of the solicitor. So that's my proposed amendment. I'll second that. All right, we have a motion to amend the agenda. Any questions or comments on the, uh, on the amending of the agenda bit? Um, I'd only say, you know, I, I think I support amending agendas uh, the night of the meeting very sparingly. Um, but my understanding from Ms. Ruther is that um, this is extremely time sensitive and they can't um, wait until the next meeting lest we not get this in place in time for the primary. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, this, the delay in sending it um, out was is not going to prejudice voters in the sense that um, they can file an application to receive a mail-in ballot for the May primary up through May 11th. Uh, however, there was a statutory 
date by which counties were to, so to have mailed this out, which was February 1st. Delaware County, like, as I said, this was in the, in the crush of lawsuits and, um, you know, COVID, people are out with COVID, including right now, the chief clerk of the election bureau um, is, is on a COVID protocol. So there's different things that have been going on that have just disrupted workflows. And um, this did not happen when it was supposed to happen. The best way to make sure it gets out no more than a week later than it should have is to be able to approve this contract tonight. Any other comments on the motion to amend? All those in favor of amending the agenda as stated, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. So I guess before us then is the underlying uh, motion. I guess we have to make that motion uh, and second it, do we not, Mr. Martin? All right, so Ms. Ruther, take it away if you're so inclined. Yes, I actually have the uh, a, an agenda action item was prepared and submitted and a tremendous amount of work went into getting this ready for tonight's meeting, even though it's late. Um, so the motion is to approve a contract with RBM Consulting CoStars vendor number 362724 in the amount of 6000 I'm $63,900 to send out uh, roughly 104,000 uh, permanent mail-in ballot applications as directed under Act 77, um, subject to the solicitor's approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Anything, uh, any questions or comments from council on the uh, underlying motion? I, I would just note also for the record, you know, I made a point of including the CoStars number because this is a CoStars vendor. We are, uh, this was checked with the solicitor's office. There is no requirement that it be bid. And by the way, that's $63,900. The bulk of that is the mailing cost. The printing cost is only about a third of that. And this is comparable to the, the fees that were paid previously, Mr. Ruther, do you know? Yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, the mailing permit price is the same that we would have paid. Um, and the, uh, the printing cost is, as I said, it's, it's just about $22,000 to print. Uh, it's a two page mailing with a return envelope, there is no postage being paid on the return envelope, but it is a it is addressed to the election bureau, and um, you know the outer envelope, and the insertion, and obviously handling the mailing process with the post office. So yes, it is it is very comparable. Christine, what? is there going to be any explanation with it, or is it people will just receive the application? Or no, no, they there's there's actually a. Uh, in, in some respects, the fact that this is going out after other counties or neighboring counties mailings went out has, has proved to be beneficial because the uh, form that most of the counties used is the form, the uh, suggested form provided by the Secretary of State's office, which um, uh, it, 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 let's just say it was not written with the usual lucidity that we've come to expect from Mr. Martin and his staff. Uh, it was very difficult to understand, um, including our uh, election board solicitor had to read it five times. So it was rewritten in plain English. Um, and we also found that there's two possible forms they can return. One is to be taken off the uh, annual mailing of a, of a ballot application. Maybe they prefer to do it online, which we would certainly prefer that they do. Um, and you can deal with that. The notice explains you can deal with that by simply returning a signed page. Well, what a lot of people did because the way the form is set up, it looks like you can just rip off the bottom third and sign it and send it back. Of course, there's no place where your name is stated or your voter ID number. So we, the, the counties, what we what we found out talking to other counties about their experience is this has been coming back um, and they haven't been able to identify the voter. So we're actually making sure that the voter number is also on the bottom third of the page, should people do that. 
using the same form. So there've been some other, you know, and there've been some other benefits by send, setting it up with a, with a barcode, we should be able to go more quickly to each record. And since we're sending out 104,000 of these, if you get 60,000 of them back and you've got to go in and find that record, being able to just barcode it and find that, you know, wand the barcode and find the record as opposed to having to go in and search for the record is a savings of time. So we, in effect, having taken some extra time, the people, the parties who are being disadvantaged by this going out a week late is really the county because we're going to have one less week to process applications. But I think we have also been able to, uh, save some time by learning from the missteps of others. Well, look, I guess for my part, I would say that, that I'm in favor of doing anything that assists people in being able to vote. Um, and I think mail-in voting is, serves that end. The more people we invite to, to engage in our democracy, I think the better off we're served. And that's made even more compelling when you have COVID that is still present with us and likely still will be present with us during the primary. So. Uh, I'm in favor of this um, and uh, appreciate Ms. Ruth for bringing this to, uh, to council tonight, uh, even if it's on late notice. Any other questions from council? All right, hearing none, all those in favor of uh, this agenda item, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you, Ms. Ruther. So this is, uh, I believe, 15A then, Ms. Coogan, correct? That's correct, thank you. Uh, agenda item number 16, motion for approval of Central Tax Collection Department's request for refunds for the year 2020 county real estate taxes for 11 property owners due to the overpayment of amount of taxes due. Mr. Martin. Um, this uh, is a request for a reimbursement totaling $17,593. As I indicated yesterday, it is slightly larger than normal because there is one reimbursement of $11,400. The background is that it's in connection with a Rite Aid on Westchester Pike. Um, and the background circumstances, the Rite Aid corporate erroneously submitted a combined check for two of its properties, one of which had already had its taxes paid. And our treasury department employee, uh, because it was just up against the deadline, made a decision, an appropriate decision to cash the check so that the second property would have its taxes paid on time, knowing that in cashing the check or depositing the check, uh, it would result in an overpayment for the one uh, property, and then they reversed it out by having this repayment. So um, it was a it was not a uh, error on the county part; it was an error on the property owner's part, and uh, that's the story behind the eleven thousand four hundred. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Martin? Hearing none, then all those in favor of agenda item number sixteen, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Agenda item number 17, motion for approval of adoption of resolution designating persons authorized to sign checks. The five members of County Council, Joanne Phillips, County Controller, and James Hackett, Interim Treasurer. Second. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Uh, this circumstance, um, is a result of one of the county's banks uh, submitting for confirmation by the clerk of council uh, a resolution. And the reason it's come before council is that the treasurer of the county historically has been um, authorized to sign off of this account. Mr. Hackett has recently been appointed as interim treasurer. So he as an individual uh, needs to be uh, designated by county as a, as a uh, signatory. And as part of that process, we are confirming the previously uh, provided authorizations of the five council members and Ms. Phillips as controller. 
Thank you. Any questions from council? All those in favor of agenda item number 17, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Agenda item number 18, motion for approval, request by the controller's office for payment of current bills. Second. Thank you. Ms. Phillips, anything of note? Um, no, just to let you know, we're still, uh, we're still paying bills from 2020. Um, the county has a 13th period that bills are still coming in, but yet we're also paying uh, bills for certain grants and um, departments in 21 as well. So, uh, and there was also $566,000 um, of COVID CARES money uh, in this uh, check run as well. Thank you, Ms. Phillips. Any questions from council? Hearing none, all those in favor of agenda item number 18, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. We'll look to Mr. Lazarus for uh, communications from the executive director. Uh, Mr. Chair, I do not have anything specific for this evening. Okay, thank you. Mr. Martin, solicitor's report. Uh, likewise, Mr. Chairman, nothing this evening, thank you. All right, uh, the next agenda item calls for a public comment. Ms. Ruther, do we have any uh, comments from the public this evening? We do. We have quite a few. Um, there is one that came in uh, on uh, January 21st uh, from Joe Dignazio, 810 Westdale Avenue, Swarthmore, PA. What is the current estimated award date for the new radio system network project? I don't know if, if we have a, uh, has that gone out to even to bid yet, Mr. Lazarus? Um, Ms. Ruther, thank you for the question. We are have gone through with um, our county solicitor staff cleaning up the specifications for the uh, design and project management contract to make sure that it incorporates um, singular responsibility to make sure that when the system is put in place, it works. We spoke with some of the police chiefs and we need to go back to some of the municipalities address cost share at some point in the future as well, with the recognition that the backbone is our responsibility. So I would anticipate we'll have the contract done and ready to bring back to council, perhaps at the next meeting for the design and project management. So what would be coming back at the next meeting would be the RFP that we'd be approving to send out or the contract? Contract. Okay, thank you. Uh, Uh, there's another, there's an item here that was sent to all of council. It does not have an address on it. All right. Um, but we can address it uh, individually. Uh, okay, we have several comments that are all addressing the topic of uh, returning children to school in light of the pandemic. I'm going to read them to the extent, but but may if they replicate an earlier one, simply reference the earlier one with the name of the person and address. From Pat uh, De Persia, 5 Elliott Road, Broomall, PA, uh, Delaware County Council, if not already addressed, would be appreciated, would appreciate it if you could comment on plans to get children back in school full-time if their families are willing. Well, I know there are families that are at risk or have personal reasons for not wanting to go back to school at this time. Many of us are ready. Our children are ready. Our president, the CDC director, and even Fauci are stating that science supports sending children back to school. Just like we followed the science that masks work, we should be following the science that appears to show COVID is not spreading in our schools. Public schools all over the country have returned to school, some as early as September, 2020. We do not appear to be seeing a spread of COVID in our schools. At the same time, many of our children are suffering. They are unable to socialize with friends. They're spending hours in front of screens and simply not absorbing anything. 
I believe we are at a point that we are now doing more harm than good for our children. Having them in school appears to be one of the safest places they can be as they are forced to follow social distancing guidelines. At home, especially with parents who are out of the house, working guidelines may not be followed. Most importantly, children need to be social, even if done from a few feet away from a desk in school. Please push for schools to return safely ASAP. Any um, information you could provide regarding plans to get children back in school is appreciated. From uh, John DeMeo, 115 Sylvan Drive, Brumall, PA. The CDC's position is that schools can now safely reopen even if teachers are not vaccinated for the coronavirus. Additionally, the CDC and the WHO recommend a minimum of three feet distancing in schools. Many schools have been operating this way safely since September of 2020, but public schools in Delco have been following the Chesco recommendation of six feet instead. Why is the Chesco recommendation more strict than the CDC and WHO's recommendation? Changing this could allow more students in school and in class with instruction five days a week. Even if it's felt teachers need to be vaccinated, why can't they be moved up to 1A status? Thank you. I'm not sure 100% of that is right in that I believe the CDCA or the CDC has said six feet is its recommended guidance, but um, I will not second guess it in light of these other comments. From Christina uh, Convery, 316 Netherington Drive, Brumall, PA. I'm a high school teacher and a mom of two, and I'm requesting that we get kids back in school full time for the families that feel comfortable doing so. I was wondering if you could comment on getting children back in schools full time if the families are willing. I understand there are still some families that are hesitant. Many of us are ready and our kids desperately need it. I do think an all virtual option should be allowed for those that are not comfortable sending their kids back full time in person. Our president and the CDC director are saying the kids belong in school. They are following the science that masks work and we should be following the science that showing COVID is not spreading in the schools. Um, this continues along the same lines as Mr. Purse's comment. From Michael Gowdy, 207 Arden Road, Broomall. I'm asking County Council to advocate on behalf of all public school students in Delaware County as our children have unfairly borne the largest burden of this crisis. In August of 2020, the Chester County Health Department on behalf of Delaware County consulted with Policy Lab at CHOP to formulate health guidelines for our public schools. These guidelines effectively led to practically all public schools being shut down until October 2020 and some schools for much longer. Currently, most schools are operating on a hybrid schedule, which for most kids is failing them, especially our youngest. On Friday, January 22nd, Policy Lab hosted a public webinar in which they updated their guidance for schools. These new guidelines would allow most of our schools to open full time with the change of a required six feet between desks dropping down to a minimum of three feet. Uh, shockingly, Policy Lab also stated that the data now proves children attending school on a computer screen at home are statistically more likely to catch COVID than those attending schools in person full time. With the precautions for our school, the schools are following, schools are proven to be safe for both children and teachers. This was confirmed by the new head of the CDC, Rochelle Walensky, who stated this just yesterday. I asked council to ask the Chester County Health Department why they have not adopted these updated policy lab guidelines. The question needs to be asked, why were they so eager to adopt policy lab guidelines when they shut schools down, but not adopting them when policy lab says schools are safe and should be open? Our children have suffered long enough please fight for them, thank you. I would only note um, that we have seen drafts of guidance from the Chester County Health Department that is addressing the things that are uh, discussed in, in this comment. And Dr. Taylor, I don't know if you, but I don't believe those that the new guidance is final, but it is being circulated in draft form and is being shared with the schools. That's my understanding, is, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. It's been drafted and it's been shared with the school superintendents and have has asked for input from them before it's final in public. So uh, it has not been released yet, but I believe this uh, person's comment is in fact being um, addressed by the Chester County Health Department. It's in process. Um, 
from Christine Peterson, 685 Barclay Lane, Brumall, PA. Now that the American Academy of Pediatrics, CHOP, and CDC are all stating the kids should be back in school full time, will you be working with Chester County Health Department to get our kids back to school full time with guidelines that are balanced, providing safety measures, but also creating a mentally healthy environment for students? Kids are suffering. It's not right for children to spend all their time in front of a screen. Um, I think we've addressed it that. Um, Theodore Bachansky, 2888 Penview Avenue, Brumall, PA. Dear board members, I understand that the Chester County Department of Health has recommended that the six foot restriction should be reduced by half to three feet. I also understand that this council members have made public statements suggesting that they will not follow these new guidelines. Mm -hmm. I would like those members who now have decided not to follow the health department and the CDC on these new guidelines to explain their reasons and to produce studies or other health professional opinions to support their resistance to changing, um, to change regarding uh, COVID procedures. I am not aware of anybody on this council having said we're not following the guidance of the Chester County Health Department. Is, is Does anybody want to, I think we're all here today, does anybody on council want to raise their hand and say they don't want to follow whatever it is the Chester County Health Department says? Okay, nobody. Uh, so I think, I think Mr. Bochansky has been misinformed. Um, from John Bohan, uh, 235 Valley Ridge Road, Haverford, PA. Um, when will Delaware County adjust our real estate taxes based on the new assessments? Um, I can answer that question. The new assessment uh, that you received, if you're not, if you don't have an appeal pending with the Court of Common Pleas, is your final assessment for tax purposes. And I guess even if you do have an appeal pending, it is your final assessment until such time as that appeal is resolved. And you have the new, um, you have the new uh, millage rate. And if you are like me in the, you know, this week you will have received your tax bill from the county. So then you should certainly know what your new county real estate taxes are. I imagine the same is true for your municipal taxes. Uh, the school district taxes, I don't know, they should have restated their millage, but a lot of them may not do it until their um, budgeting process kicks off, which probably won't be until April. Um, since they set their, their, their fiscal year runs um, from July 1 to June 30. Um, what I can tell you is I, I did learn today that the county's website have not necessarily, uh, the county's website has not necessarily been updated um, for all the properties. It is something I'm talking to the Board of Assessment about, but uh, you should have your new county real estate taxes. And if you don't have them yet, it's probably a delay in the mail because they were mailed out. Does anybody else want to comment on that? No, okay. Uh, Good evening. Um, this is from Jennifer DeMeo, 115 Sylvan Drive, Brumall, PA. Um, since September, many area private and Catholic schools have been open with little difficulty while Delaware County public schools remain virtual or hybrid. Many surrounding public schools, including my school district of Marple Newtown have said they cannot open five days if they have to maintain six feet of distance. Private schools and even public schools in other countries, including in other counties, including Bucks County, maintain six feet when possible and three feet at a minimum. Why is there such a discrepancy within schools in the state of Pennsylvania? Please help Delaware County public schools open for all children to have five day in-person education. The date reflects schools are, the data re reflects schools are a safe place for children. We are seeing all over news, different teacher unions. <coughs> Excuse me. Bless you. Um, not wanting to return to in-person education, do you feel the PA Teachers Union have a large influence over the return of five-day in-person education in Delaware County? Another hurdle is some teachers do not want to return until they receive the vaccine. Please, please assist with vaccinating the teachers in Delaware County who want the vaccine. Thank you for your time and consideration. Mr. Lazarus, how much of our CARES Act funding did we allocate to the schools specifically so that they could operate um, safely uh, in person where possible? Uh, council approved $20 million last October for with the um, 
to address distance learning as well as facility improvements to allow returns to school. So while we have zero authority over what school districts decide to do in terms of whether to be open or hybrid or virtual, we certainly, uh, this council certainly made a major investment <laughs> to support their ability to, to open. I just want that to be on the record. And I would point out that uh, Delaware County invested substantial effort in um, building a plan for vaccinating teachers only to uh, have the state from whom the county receives its vaccine supply, uh, revise the guidelines. And due to the fact that our seniors are the vast majority of the people dying from um, COVID uh, place them at a higher level of priority. Uh, there's literally nothing we could do about that. We're dependent upon the state for the vaccines that we are able to distribute and have to follow their guidelines. That's my understanding. Otherwise, um, I, I certainly see the logic to putting teachers higher up the list. Um, from Kathy Hinkle, Five Wells Fleet Way, Media PA. Hello, I'm writing in regard to reopening of schools for the meeting tonight. Our school district leaders have repeatedly said that they are mandated to stay hybrid due to the six foot distance restrictions placed on schools. The CCHD and state says it is not a mandate, but guidance. Our children are suffering emotionally, physically, and academically, and families should have the option to be in school full time if that is what their child needs. The CDC, JAMA, CHOP, Policy Lab, and plenty of literature support that schools are safe to open. It has been a year. These children have been out of school with no plan to return, while surrounding regional districts have successfully returned, in addition to private and parochial schools. Please work with the leaders of the school community to get the education children are entitled to. Um, you know, I'm, I'm highly sympathetic to all of these people. I would just point out that we don't really have any control other than we've tried to assist them in every way we can. Um, it, this is these, many of these comments, while I am highly sympathetic, should be directed to the school districts. Here's another one from Brianna Sati, 144 Beachwood Road, Newtown Square, PA. Schools in other counties in the state are open. There are no significant health risks to students or teachers to be in the schools. There is no scientific data showing that online education or hybrid learning is keeping anyone safe. In fact, it's doing the opposite. Depression, anxiety, and suicide rates among children have skyrocketed far beyond the less than 1% of deaths caused by COVID. We need the representatives we voted for to stand up for us. Every Delco voter will be watching to see which council members support parents and students of the county and um, we are charging you to protect our children by opening schools full time and immediately. Even if you don't have jurisdiction, we wanna hear a statement from you requesting all schools should be open full time. All right, I've been, I've been biting my tongue here as uh, you might imagine for some time here. Um, I, will, I will offer the following uh, commentary for what it's worth. Um, I have forcefully, repeatedly, much to the frustration probably of uh, frequent viewers of this program, consistently argued in favor of returning our children to in-person learning. I have been concerned about the choices we have made, um, both on council, but more in our society where we put our creature comforts, our desires to eat in-person dining, our desires to play football and have wrestling uh, practice over our concerns about our children being, being in person. Um, the fact of the matter is this council has no authority whatsoever to have any impact on whether schools are in person or they are not in person. We can give them money to say, hey, if you are not in person because you don't have PPE, here's some money to buy some PPE. But this lies solely, the sole decision maker here is the school boards. The school boards, there is no mandate, there is no impediment coming from the Chester County Health Department saying that schools cannot open. Uh, school boards are uh, charged with this, and you know, it's not for me to say for each and every school whether they have the ability to open or not. I don't know what each school looks like. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I respect the fact that they know their schools better than we do, but I share each of these commenters' frustrations that our kids are not in school. I watched last spring as my six-year-old and my eight-year-old went virtual and learned just about nothing. 
there, there ain't no way a six-year-old is going to learn how to read on an iPad. Uh, just, well, mine didn't anyway. Maybe others do. But uh, getting a six-year-old to sit still for hour after hour is just not realistic. And, uh, you know, I'm sure the, the same is true for, for many other students, whether they be special needs uh, or were like me, just rambunctious and wanted to uh, had trouble sitting still for, for, um, for substantial periods of time. So, um, you know, I, I have raised concerns about the impact that this school year, almost a full year now for many students not being in school, I think that we are gonna hear about this for years to come. The, the negative implications, the negative impacts of our kids not being in school are gonna be felt for years and years. So I share everybody's frustration. I'm with you on it. Uh, I encourage you to reach out to, um, uh, uh, to your school boards um, and uh, advocate as you believe is appropriate for your children that they open up. I'm you know, sympathetic to the fears of school teachers, um, just as I'm sympathetic to the fears of uh, many um, essential workers, folks who work in grocery stores and and are uh, working on uh, our transportation, uh, folks who work have been working in our healthcare delivery systems for for this past year. Um, I'm sympathetic to those concerns, and I don't mean to diminish them. Um, but uh, collectively, it has been it has been my feeling, and it remains my feeling that we as a society have failed our children for this last year, and I hope that it comes to an end pretty darn quickly. Yeah, um, we've said this over and over and over again. Um, we have said this to school superintendents and to be very candid, they've told us, we hear you, we no longer wanna hear you tell us the same thing over and over again. Um, so please believe us, we have expressed and advocated in every possible way. We are no longer invited by the school superintendents to share this view with them. It is their decision. They've made that clear to us and um, as Brian said, we suggest you bring your concerns to the school superintendents and school boards. Yeah, just to reiterate that point, and I didn't mean to make it too, that we, we were early on in this uh, advocating, some of us were advocating strongly with the DCIU. Uh, I was literally not allowed into the Zoom meetings anymore. I would be on the invite and then I would be asked to be admitted to the room and they just, they just didn't wanna hear from me anymore. So, um, you know, perhaps that's my fault for not being more delicate and judicious in the way that I present my views. Uh, and, you know, for that, I'll bear responsibility. But um, it's, it, it certainly has been a consistent theme from, um, um, uh, from, from some, if not all, on council that, uh, uh, that we advocate for schools to be open, that we recognize the value of in-person learnings. And the DCIU stopped wanting to hear from me, frankly. I just, I want to acknowledge that the superintendents and the school boards in this county are facing incredibly different gut-wrenching, soul-searching decision-making. And um, they are making the, their decisions in the best interests that they believe for their school districts. Um, we, as council, we have always wanted, <laughs> most people want to, I'd say everyone wants to see children in our schools, but the school districts have a lot of a lot of factors to weigh. So I don't want to disparage them or to um, second guess them in any way. I, this council has wanted to support them, continues to want to support them, wants to have a collaborative and cooperative and supportive relationship. We appreciate the difficult decision making that they have. Um, with all of the different factors they have to consider. Um, and we hope that, um, you know, as the, the virus numbers get better and as the vaccinations go up, this will become less of a gut-wrenching issue and we can get everyone in schools. I would like to reiterate what Ms. Schaefer is saying that we want, we are trying to have a collaborative relationship with our school districts and support them in every way that we possibly can. And in Delaware County, we have 16 individual school districts and none are the same as the other. They are all so very different. There are districts who are yet to go hybrid at all, who have been virtual the entire time because maybe their classrooms or their buildings are old and outdated and they have 20 to 30 kids in a classroom where other school districts have 10 to 15 in a classroom. So there are so many different factors that each school district has to deal with. And so each school district has to take that into account when they're making the decisions that are going to be for the health and wellness of their students. And so that's why it's not a council decision. This is 
for the school districts and their administrations and their school boards to make together in the best interest of their population. I, I appreciate that. Well, one thing I would, um, I, I do sometimes wonder why we keep listening to the CHOP Policy Lab. Um, you know, I appreciate that they're doing their best, but the research seems to suggest that they got it wrong here and that they unnecessarily um, said that the sky was falling when it wasn't. And there are significant implications from that. And I think back, you know, sometimes I'll watch the NFL draft because I'm a bit of a draft junkie. And you get these experts that come on and year after they say, this is a can't miss player. And then you look back three years later and that player was, was uh, uh, just didn't pan out. And yet year after year, we listen to these folks. And, uh, you know, I think it's sometimes uh, not for purposes of disparaging folks, but we need to take an assessment as to whether or not, um, uh, you know, what their track record is so that we can determine what, whether and to what extent we should be listening to what they say going forward. You know, I'll just reiterate uh, that a lot of people's concerns are in fact being addressed by the Chester County Health Department as they update their guidance, um, taking into account lessons that have been learned and that it is just that, it is guidance because ultimately it's, it's the Department of Education at the state and the state health department that uh, they're the only people who can impose requirements on the school's absence uh, the Chester County Health Department finding that there is a truly a COVID emergency and a super spreading kind of event going on inside of the school, which uh, I don't know uh, that that is happening in school per se. I do know that there have been incidents in extracurricular activities and sports and things like that, uh, which is being taken into account in the guidance. So I, know how difficult this is. I am very grateful my children um, are out of school, but I'm suffering with a child who is still virtual in college and will be virtual through all of this year. She will have lost a year and a half of, you know, one of the things that college life offers, which is that sense of community, that socialization that these parents have spoken of. And so I'm, I'm incredibly, uh, aware of the pain that they're feeling and it must be much worse when you're dealing with younger children who are less able to articulate it and probably less able to sit down and focus. And um, you have my sympathy and I wish there was more that we could do, but rest assured that we have done what we can do, which is to make resources available. And we're supporting um, our staff and other people who are working to communicate with the schools and provide updated guidance. Um, next comment is from Cynthia Long, 9 Cloverdale Avenue, Upper Darby, PA. Uh, Dear Delaware County Council, I oppose any changes to the county residency requirement. Do not change the residency requirement. Well, we did change it, but we did not eliminate it. We are simply making it consistent with the way that it has been um, uh, operated for the most part. Uh, from Francis Winterell, 20 East Langhorne Avenue, Havertown, PA, please do not change the current residency requirement in Delaware County. We need to hire from within the county, especially during this fragile employment period. Um, again, I will only say that the county has long been willing to hire from outside the county on the condition that people move in, except in certain uh, licensed job categories where they have not been able to hire sufficient numbers of people that will continue to be the case. 800 uh, from George R. This is a first. I have a, a person who's given their first name and last initial and address, but not their last name. Mr. Martin is- Don't read it. Don't read it, okay. Um, from Michael Martin, 9 Cloverdale Avenue, Upper Darby, PA, in regards to changing the residency requirements. Not very long, a violent, not very long ago, a violent mob walked through my neighborhood, smashed windows, causing damage, and stealing from local businesses along Westchester Pike, 69th Street, and City Line Avenue. Jobs in the county should go to people who have here have been here most, if not all, of their lives and have come to know and love Delaware County, not those fleeing the dysfunctional environment of Philadelphia. In short, jobs for residents, not rioters. I got nothing to say to that. And that is all that I have. 
Thank you, Ms. Ruther. Uh, the next item on the agenda calls for council comments, and we'll look to Ms. Ruther if you're uh, if you're up for it. Uh, you know, I think I will uh, pass tonight as I had so many comments I got to read. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Ruther. Ms. Schaefer. I just have two quick announcements. The first is that the um, applications are still being accepted for the new green space task force in the county, which is an ele a new 11 person task force um, who will be defining and um, administering and promoting uh, our open space and trails program in Delaware County. Um, so get on the website under boards and commissions, open seats, and you can find the application process. The second thing I wanted to call your attention to if you are fond of trails um, in, the, in the county is that this Saturday from nine to 12, there is a summit. And it's um, it, this is an annual event where all the people who are involved in uh, putting in supporting our trails and building trails and improving our trail connections all over the county um, come together and present progress, including the, the county ourselves, we ourselves as a county present our progress. Um, it's going to be virtual this year. And if you're interested in attending, you can get on the website for Friends of Haverford Trails, which is, I think it's havetrail.com, H-A-V-trail.com. Um, and go ahead and sign up. Um, as I said, nine o'clock to, to 12 o'clock this coming Saturday, February 6th. That's it. Thank you, Ms. Schaefer. Mr. Madden. Nothing more from me tonight, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Madden. Dr. Taylor. Nothing more from me tonight. All right, well, I've probably spoken more than I should have already, but uh, I guess I'll just um, make a nod to the fact that February is Black History Month and um, uh, encourage people to, um, uh, to recognize that and celebrate that however they do. Um, I think it's important for us to make sure that um, the histories of people that perhaps have been ignored for too often uh, and too long are uh, given some more attention. It, it, uh, I think it betters all of our society when we do so. And uh, with that, I will just wish that everybody continue to stay safe. Uh, I know it's uh, tiresome wearing masks and we all want this to be over. Um, we're working as hard as we can to get vaccinated. We'll keep working, uh, doing whatever we can at the county to get as much vaccine as possible here. In the meantime, we ask that you continue to adhere to best practices and uh, wear masks, social distance, all the boring stuff that we keep saying. Um, but uh, we've seen a lot of loss of life over the last three weeks here in Delaware County. And, um, you know, it really brings home why we're doing what we're doing. So uh, I, just please, please be safe. And that's all I have. With that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion is second. Any questions, comments? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. Hey, Red. Hey.